Thank you all for showing up. I, I am Margaret Bauer. I'm editor of the North Carolina Literary Review for going on 25 years now. Um, I am thrilled to be co-sponsoring uh, this event with Press 53. Uh, it, it is an appropriate evening to talk about the work of John Ely as today is the third anniversary of his passing. I know his loved ones are thinking about him today and always, and it's good for us all to remember him and giving, giving them the comfort of knowing that he is not forgotten. So I'm a, a scholar of Southern literature and I had not heard much about John Ely before coming to North Carolina until Kevin sent me a review copy of Press 53's new edition of The Land Breakers many years ago now. I was about to teach North Carolina literature the next semester, so I thought I'd check it out rather than send it out right away for review. I did send it out for review eventually, but I read it first. And I taught it, and then I read the whole series of Ely's historical fiction novels, including the ones he didn't consider to be part of the series. The thing I like about Ely's uh, historical fiction is that he uses different styles of historical fiction to suit the story of each novel. So they're not all the same. And for those who don't know, uh, the novels uh, have interrelated uh, family members and some recurring characters, but they are each autonomous and uh, spanning from the settling of North Carolina and the land breakers to Asheville at the turn of the 20th century. Um, over the years, thanks to Kevin and Southern literary scholar turned novelist Terry Roberts, though, I have become an Ely aficionado. When the author died, I wanted to do something to honor him, acknowledge his passing, and recognize the gift he left us. And with Kevin and Terry Roberts came up with the John Ely Prize for the best essay or interview about a North Carolina writer whose work has not gotten the kind of critical attention it warrants, like John Ely's work, alas. Though NCLR is sure trying to fill that gap, and, and again, with Terry's help, we've added significantly to the Ely Scholarship. We have an essay in the 2010 issue featuring Appalachian literature of North Carolina. Uh, it opens the issue with an essay by Terry and includes, the, with the author's generous permission, my favorite section of the Land Breakers. And then uh, in 2012, Terry wrote a, an essay. Uh, this was our North Carolina literature into film um, issue. And Terry wrote an essay on the film adaptations as well as one of Ely's novels that was turned in, that was about making a film. So it's a novel, but it was about the, the group making a film. And um, by the way, I'm just going to give my own commercial side, and Kevin's going to talk a, about another, give another. Um, uh, a commercial later, but um, if you order these copies before the end of March, we are having a 25% off sale all through March. And so I will, when I come out from under, I'll put in the chat a link so uh, and, and the promo promotion code so that you can get these copies 25% off. It's a deal. Um, you can also read Terry's Remembrance of the Author's Friendship and Mentoring in NCLR Online 2019, where you'll find um, uh, in, 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 2019, in our most recent issue of NCLR Online, you'll see a story about the Ely Prize that we are celebrating this evening. Uh, this is the third prize, uh, the first uh, to be given on an essay on John Ely. The first Ely Prize went to Patrick Horn in 2019 for an essay on George Moses Horton, an enslaved poet of North Carolina. Last year, the prize went to Jim Grimsley for his interview with Moira Crone, a North Carolina writer who, like Grimsley, is a writer of many genres, in her case, fiction, speculative fiction, poetry, and now she's also a painter in New Orleans. Uh, this year's winner is going to talk with us in a few minutes about her essay, but first I'd like to introduce Terry Roberts, who will read from Ely's The Road, which is the subject of the prize essay. Terry is the author of four novels, A Short Time to Stay Here, which won the Willie Morris Prize for Southern Fiction and the Sir Walter Raleigh Award for Fiction. That Bright Land, which is the winner of the Thomas Wolfe Literary Award, the James Still Award for writing about the Appalachian South, and the Sir Walter Raleigh Award for fiction. Most recently, the Holy Ghost Speakeasy and Revival, and coming out this summer, My Mistress Eyes Are Raven Black. He's from the mountains he sets his novels in, 
And his scholarship includes a book on the beloved Mississippi-born writer, Elizabeth Spencer, whom North Carolina claims for all her years living here. I thank Terry for his work on both Ely and Spencer for NCLR and for joining us this evening to read to us. Thank you, Margaret. You're very kind. I, <clears throat> I will say this is a labor of love. I would come, I would walk 10 miles to get on this Zoom to be able to do this. Um, I'll also say there's an old hound dog over here behind me. You can't see Bodie, but whenever uh, Kevin and I would talk to John on the phone in the last years of his life, you know, if we were going to see him, he'd say, well, come on. He'd say, bring your dog. And so there's a sense in which Bodie's here uh, in, in response to that. And I can imagine John smiling. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs that open the road and then just a little bit further on in in the second chapter that talks about building the railroad from essentially from old Fort North Carolina up to what is now um, the Swannanoa Valley. And for those of you who've traveled 70 or I-40 or and in some cases walked that railroad, which I've done, it's, it's a spectacular it's a spectacular thing and it's an astonishing engineering feat. And it's based on the historical events which took place in the 1870s. And I'll leave, I'll leave, I'll leave all that to Savannah who will do a wonderful job with it. This from The Road by John Ely, chapter one. The mountain on whose body they were to work was set on the lowlands at Henry Station, which was a work camp being built by the Western North Carolina Railroad Company. It rose from that point, which was about 1,500 feet above sea level, to its peak, which was almost 5,000 feet. The mountain itself, in other words, was about two-thirds of a mile tall. It was called Sal Mountain and was a massive monolith of earth, rock, vegetation, and water an elaborate series of ridges which built on one another to the top. From the base, a man could see what he assumed was the top of the mountain and could walk there only to find that he stood on the crest of a ridge which rested against the side of the mountain. He could walk to the top of the mountain as he had seen it from that ridge and find it was also the crest of a ridge and nothing more. And above lay the summit. So it went that by layers, the mountain unfolded itself, climbing to the top, whether be right once declared, was like ascending to some altitude of oneself. And then this from chapter two, where they're surveying the route of the railroad. Uh, in addition to Weatherby, who's the chief engineer, there's a man named Cumberland, who is a college man, and I believe Santa's, Savannah's going to talk a little bit about him, uh, who comes to join the, the road, the building of the road, as an accountant. Um, and so he's a, he's, a, he's a college man, he's a greenhorn, he's not used to this kind of thing. And in this section, they're, they're surveying where the road is going to go. And it lists a lot of place names which are accurate to the map. Cumberland said very little. He was content to watch as Weatherby's mind unraveled the problem which encircled him and wrapped him with its trees and creeks and rocks and wonders. He was a visitor on the mountainside even as he sought a way to conquer it. Next day, they curved the road around on Sal Mountain coming at last to a place only 200 feet from where the day before at midday they had been. They could look down at the other camping place and whether be wondered aloud if the lower road would be covered by the fill from the higher road. He made notations on the face of a rock, writing with the tip of his knife, and decided there would be 10 to 30 feet to spare. The road moved to the north for a ways, curving over a major cut. Then it moved to the west toward Round Knob and turned northwest where the route had been surveyed before them and this time came to a cliff below which they could see a spot where, earlier in the morning, they had surveyed. They ate dinner, then moved northwest along the mountainside to the second branch of Babcock Fish Creek, 
where a culvert was to be made. Lying between this branch and the third branch of Babcock was a ridge called Birch Ridge, and it was possible to cut through it, but Weatherby decided to gain as much elevation as he could by going around the spur of it. They reached the third branch about evening and crossed it and camped there. They had marked off two or three miles that day. They camped on Horse Ridge where chestnuts abounded, so they roasted enough for breakfast and to eat as they worked. They turned the road to the southwest through what was to be a long, deep cut. They came to a bubbly creek, merely a branch, and directly before them was the spit of a ridge, an outcropping of rock. Weatherby stopped beneath it and said this was the site of the first tunnel. The men must blast through the rock, he said. He and Babcock climbed to the precipice and an hour later came back, talking, studying. It was the work of another hour to determine that first tunnel would be about 125 feet long. The party ate smoked pork while sitting in the shadow of the spur and then moved around it to the next little spur, which Weatherby and Babcock clambered over. They decided second tunnel would be 200 feet long, maybe 225. They surveyed now to the southwest, gaining elevation. They came to a spur which Weatherby named Lick Log, for he found there a forked log which once had been used by men salting cattle or deer. He surveyed a tunnel through that spur and estimated it would be 670 feet long, and he named it Lick Log Tunnel. In the late afternoon, he moved on a ways to another outcropping of rock and clambered over that, another tunnel to be blasted out. The camp that night was facing the southeast and was high on the mountain. They were about a mile from the turnpike so they could hear the drover's music being played, could hear men yelling and singing for the wind was from the south. A lost sheep came into camp, Weatherby let it stay. It lay down in the campfire light and panted like a dog, to, so scared it was, so fast it had run, so close had come the wolves. The next morning, the sheep followed along as they marked the road, which was to go along the side of the mountain for about 4,000 feet, till it crossed the turnpike at the middle of a straight tangent. Later, Beneath where he stood, a tunnel would go, connecting at last the outlands and the mountain country. It would be the new river, the new road, the new narrow channel that would make possible the rising of cities, the growth of commerce, the increase in wealth and health and stability of the region, which extended 50 miles westward from where he stood. When he came back to camp, he began to survey the tunnel. He spent all day doing it and found it to be about 2,000 feet in length, and he named it the Swananoa Tunnel. They camped at the eastern portal. To one side of them were the lowlands. On the other side of them was the jagged face of the mountain, hiding from their sight the mountain plateau, which had a river flowing through it and mountains rising around it. The river flowed on westward through other valleys, accepting water from many tributaries until it merged with the French Broad River at Asheville, a tiny town of 2,400 people. Once the road got through the gap, it could follow the bed of that river into Tennessee. And I think that gives you a flavor. Thank you, Terry. That was lovely. Um, I never can go through the tunnel without thinking of John Ely. Um, so uh, now to tell us about her essay on the road, forthcoming in North Carolina Literary Review's 30th issue is our honoree of the evening, Savannah Page Murray, who like me was introduced to John Ely via a gift of books of his, including The Road. 
Savannah is a native of Asheville. She has reviewed regularly for NCLR since 2018 when she was a graduate student at Appalachian State University. Her NCLR essay is adapted from her 2017 th thesis, In This Way the Mountain Lives, an eco-critical reading of John Ely's Appalachian fiction. After earning her PhD in rhetoric and writing from Virginia Tech, she returned to North Carolina to serve as a visiting assistant professor of rhetoric and writing studies at her alma mater and is now on the tenure track at App State. Welcome home, Savannah, and thank you for joining us this evening. Hello, thank you all so much for coming out and adding another Zoom meeting to your calendar. I hope this evening is as fun for you all as it is for me. Like has been said, I just love to talk about John Ely any chance I get. As uh, Margaret mentioned, and it's in the, well, there's a piece that kind of does a, a preview of the print edition of this essay that will be in NCLR uh, online for 2021. I did receive the road as well as the land breakers as a gift from Dr. Dan Barron of the Amy Regional Library in Burnsville. I was interning as an, uh, an, an archive in West Asheville when unfortunately in, the, in January um, of 2014, the Yancey County Library pot had a burst. And so in the middle of you know, a cold winter, all this water is just flooding down. And the archive I was working with, um, we went there to help and assist and being the kind of avid reader and lover of Appalachian culture and life that I am, I started talking with a lot of folks, you know, what do you like to read? Other volunteers there that day and ended up kind of connecting with uh, Dr. Dan, as I now call him, about uh, Ron Rash and other contemporary Appalachian writers I really like. And he said, oh, well, you've got to read John Ely. And sure enough, by the end of our, you know, time there helping save this library, I had a box with my name on it with these two magnificent books that I went straight home and read and have never been in the same sense. You know, I think that for so many of us, John Ely's work really does take you by the heart in a way, you know. Um, it for me was this reimagining of the place that I've I know and want to know more about the place that I'm from, you know. Um, some of my family members are in the audience tonight, and I have one side of the family who moved to the Asheville area from rural, you know, North Georgia to work at the Biltmore Estate, and the other side of the family that uh, ran a drugstore for many decades in downtown Asheville. So Asheville is always on my mind and in my imagination, and uh, you know, I'll, it's, I love that Terry, your passage end there, ended there talking about the French Broad River because my dissertation work was actually um, in environmental rhetorics and it was about this group who successfully opposed and prevented the implementation of Tennessee Valley Authority dams that were planned for the French Broad. So really for me as a scholar, as a reader, as a writer, I'm always thinking about Buncombe County in a way, you know, it's, so it's so wonderful to be able to come here and talk about my favorite Buncombe County writer, along with Wilma Dykeman, but that's another conversation. Uh, I think I'd like to start with um, a brief quote here from my essay that was featured in uh, the Iron Mountain Review, a publication out of Emory and Henry College. They did um, several interviews with John Ely, and this really, when I read this interview, it got me thinking about how we could understand John Ely's fiction through an eco-critical lens, which I'll touch on that a little bit as well. So in a 1987 interview um, called the John Ely issue of the Iron Mountain Review, Ely wrote the following remarks about his work set in the Appalachian Mountains. He said, the main character in these seven mountain novels is the mountains themselves. I was born under them. They cupped me as a boy, have shaded my own life. They've lorded it over me. And in my novels, they lorded over my people. Their streams are the region's blood. Their winds are deep breaths. And I just love that passage. And that really, for me, you know, I don't necessarily have a traditional uh, pedigree or academic background as a literary scholar. I was, you know, I have studied history. I've studied environmental science. I did this interdisciplinary program in Appalachian studies. And for me, this passage that Ely had in this interview was just such a clear indicator that if you were able to look at his novels in terms of the role that nature plays, that you really might be able to to figure something out, to see them in a new way, to hopefully encourage other people to read them, which is always, for me, when I write about Elia, a motive of mine as well, that everybody should read these lovely books. 
And so in the essay that um, won the prize, which I'm again so thrilled about that will be in um, NCLR 30 in print, I talk about Ely's The Road and more specifically about a character within that name, Henry Anna Plover, one of my favorite characters of literature. And um, in previous reviews uh, that were, you know, published contemporary to the release of The Road, Henry Anna was often compared to kind of being a nymph, a trickster character, sort of this, you know, forest dweller, wild child of a bit that didn't really have much else going for. And the first time I read The Road and every time since, I've said, there's no way, that's not accurate. That's not giving you the full picture of who she is. And so this essay really is tightly focused on Henry and a plover. Um, and I talk about her and in terms of this kind of theoretical idea that comes from the environmental humanities called everyday nature. And so this idea of everyday nature is suggests that rather than seeing nature as a wilderness or as even a national park as something that we escape to, you know, for a vacation or a, for a temporary passing of time, that instead nature needs to be and should be part of our everyday lives, that we should understand and recognize, you know, capital N, nature, in where we work, where we live, where we play, where we take our daily walks. And in this essay, I make the case that Henry Anna Plover absolutely does that through and through. Um, she has a few conversations um, and I've quoted in the essay that really showcased this. And as Terry mentioned, there is, um, you know, the railroad builder of Weatherby Wright, who is dead set on bringing progress to these mountains, building this railroad to create um, greater connections with the outside world to the mountain world to make Asheville bigger. And then there's also Cumberland, who is this accountant, this very much strategic man who wants to categorize and define and record everything. And, you know, throughout the novel, both of these men, um, are interested in Henrietta, bewitched by her beauty or intrigued by her youth, um, but in both way, in, in different ways, but similarly, these men do not share her environmentally aware sentiments, and in many ways in the novel, that is kind of this everyday nature that she embodies, this ethic that she has of how she interacts with the landscape is what motivates her to kind of say, forget them, you know, to um, stay true to who she really is, and that for her, this Sound Mountain is not just the back on which the railroad will be built, but it's her, it's her place of refuge. It's where she goes every day. It's this place that she views the changes in season by season, year by year. So I really did try in this essay to emphasize her, Henry and his deep connection with the landscape and through this everyday nature um, idea. And as uh, Margaret said, this did come out of the thesis work that I did as a master's student in Appalachian Studies. And my thesis director, Dr. Sandra L. Ballard is in the audience tonight. Hello, so good to see you. As well as one of my esteemed committee members and another NCLR frequent writer, Zach Vernon. Good to see you as well. Thank you all so much for coming. And I'm, trying to, I'm skimming to see if I had anything else that I had prepared, if not. Oh, I do have one other thing I'd like to emphasize. Um, part of this work for me, I do see this as hopefully being part of a bigger project about um, Ely and the environmental, and environmental writing, I would say broadly defined, because part of one of my goals as a scholar is to help us see that environmentalism in Appalachia looks a little different than it does in other places. That environmentalism, you know, as a social movement, as a, a group that has literature associated with it, is often kind of described as a very whitewashed, usually focused on the big west and national parks and wilderness sort of movement. But I really see environmentalism in Appalachia in particular as encompassing everything from, you know, John Ely's The Road to Baskin Lamar Lunsford song Swannanoa Tunnel. It's in all parts of our culture and it's in our everyday and I think that I really do see um, Ely's work as an, a fine example of that and I hope to do more um, scholarship to kind of help people see that for many of us in the mountains and that love the mountains, um, the literature and the music is just as important to loving the mountains as hiking and things like that. Thank you so much, Savannah. That was wonderful. I really appreciate it. I thought, I hope everybody saw, I put a link to NCLR's subscription information so you can subscribe and get this essay, uh, this prize winning essay. And I believe Kevin um, wanted to say something in here before we go into the Q&A. Hey, Savannah, congratulations on writing a fantastic essay. You touched on something that a lot of people overlook 
in that. And that uh, it reminded me of the land breakers when uh, Mina um, was, you know, someone once asked John, why didn't Mooney, you know, what was it about Mooney and Mina? I mean, she was, she was always here and there and the whole bit. And, and uh, when she was up on the mountain and that bear was there and the bear was kind of protecting her and laying in the street, you know, on the road and, and all this. And John said, well, just read the book. It's in the book. It's in the book. You know, he didn't want to talk about it. He wanted the book to talk about. Talk about. And he finally got frustrated. And he said, she is the mountain. And, and it just opened my eyes to something that uh, the brilliance of John's writing is that he knew that the mountain was in everyone there, that nature was a part of them their being they can't you can't escape that at all and mina was the embodiment of that just like henry anna was the embodiment of that in the road it's brilliant stuff anyway i want to congratulate you terry roberts thank you for choosing such a wonderful essay you're a you're a wonderful person for doing that um i'm going to be sending savannah a check for 250 dollars for her prize for winning this competition and uh, also, I'm going to include a 1967 first edition hardcover of The Road from John Ely's personal library. What? Um, so, and I want to invite everyone here can have a copy as well, but you have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I came across these, th th this book and, and a few other ones were given to me by Rosemary Harris Ely, John's wife. Um, I promised her I would find good homes for these books. Uh, John, as you know, uh, kept a lot of his books around. His books were a part of him. Um, he would rather have people talking about his books than talk about him. That's who he was. And um, so I found in the boxes that she gave me, a box of books, I opened there was an unopened box of books and they contained about 25 copies of The Road in it that are, I don't think this book's ever been opened, you know, except for I just opened the cover a little bit and that's all I'm going to do. So it's, it's not clipped or anything, so it's not a return. It's, a, it's an honest to God first edition from 1967. And... Um, I think John would want people who love him and love his books to have copies of this. So what we're doing is um, we're selling these for $75. I'm going to put the link down here in the chat section. You can go to the Press 53 website. I put it in there. Oh, did you? Okay, I'll just I added, did. It. I added it again. Um, $75 in this the, all the money from this is going to go help fund. It's going to fund the uh, John Ely Prize. And I think we can get a few years out of it. And we've got a few more books that we can sell too. So we're going to keep this up. And, and John's books will help fund this prize. And you all have a chance of having one of these uh, in your library. And of all of his books, this is my favorite cover of all of his books. They're just, it's just a magnificent I mean, have you ever seen a spine like that? That is just so nice. And a uh, nice photograph of John on the back, young man. So uh, anyway, you go to the website, $75 plus. You pay regular shipping, but I ship everything out uh, priority mail so it, it gets handled properly. Um, anyway, so thank you for that. Thank you, Margaret, for the idea of the John Ely Prize and for uh, welcoming Terry and I to, to be a part of that. Rose, I talked to Rosemary about it, as you know, and, and she was very excited about it and thought John would be honored. I know he would be. So that's all I wanna say for right now. Now let's talk about John Ely. 
Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate Press 53 supporting this so that we can. It's very rare that literary scholars get money <laughs> for their for their work. So it's really nice um, to have this for them. Um, but I would like to um, invite people to unmute yourselves and, uh, you know, raise your hand, unmute yourself, turn on your camera, whatever you want to do to ask a question. Type it in the chat and I'll read it. Um, Whatever you want to do, I'll give people a second. Now you should know that we're recording this tonight. We're not going to be, I don't, I don't think we'll share. We might share it publicly, but if you don't want your, your face in the video, yeah, that's, just don't good point. Just leave your camera off. Anybody? I have a question for Savannah. Savannah, you mentioned doing, you know, being excited about perhaps doing further work on John's fiction. Talk about that a little bit. What would, you know, in your dream world, um, if Margaret Bauer were to pay you, I'm, t I'm teasing Mark, don't take that too seriously, to do nothing but write about John Ely for six months, what would you write about? Oh, I love questions like this. I have so many thoughts. And, you know, it's been so wonderful to receive this and have this event tonight on my calendar because I've reread things. I've, I've revisited old notebooks. And so one thing um, is great because it connects to what you read exactly, Terry. So um, I'm really, over the past, I'd say, three or four years, I've become obsessed with place names. You know, and especially in Appalachian culture, they they often do have such rich meaning, like, you know, the ones that some of the ones that you read in the road. And there's a British scholar named um, Robert McFarlane who wrote this book called um, Landmarks, where he collected kind of variant terms for different aspects of the British landscape and traveled over Britain and wrote about those. And that book's comes to mind for me with in connection with John Ely and another and then I'll tell you what I would do. Um, Ian Marshall is another uh, environmental humanities literary scholar that I really admire and he has this book called Storyline where he walked the Appalachian Trail and wrote about walking the trail as well as wrote about literature based on and near parts of the trail throughout southern Appalachia. And so I think a very interesting project about Ely's work would be to kind of what you were saying here walk on the railroad that became the road write this sort of narrative scholarship about that and analyzing, you know, how do people use those places now while weaving in some criticism and, and some discussion and analysis of the book. So I would love to see it in this sort of walking, meditative, revisiting of these places um, that are so important to Ely's novels and to the characters themselves. So that's one thing that I would just, I would love to do. Another thing that um, I've been working on is this kind of um, broader project. So uh, the thesis that I wrote with, again, Dr. Ballard and um, Zach Byrne, who were here tonight, was about the post-pastoral. So this is um, a theory that was developed by a British in, uh, environmental studies scholar named Terry Gifford. And so Gifford kind of categorizes texts and, and suggests that that texts that fit this model of the post-pastoral could help us envision a more sustainable, um, more equitable future in terms of where we live. And he connected these, um, the post-pastoral to Charles Fraser's Cold Mountain. And when I read that, I said, oh, yeah, I see that, but what about John Ely? You know, that just really sparked um, my mind and imagination. And so that's where the thesis went. And so the thesis was about um, the land breakers and the road but I have so many notes and pages about all the mountain novels and even more than that. So I would really like to revisit um, that framework with all of these. And, and part of what, you know, you see in this essay is this emphasis on everyday nature, which it was a literature I kind of found while working on that thesis. Um, so a walking book about Ely's landscapes and um, more on this post-pastoral theory and how, you know, Appalachian literature and, and John Ely's work in particular can help us even push that further, right? I think theory's only as good as it helps you make sense of things. And I think you can learn from, you know, I think there's more that theory could benefit from understanding more about John Ely too. Do it wow. all. Wow. Do it all. 
Nice. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm thinking the same thing. Um, you know, I love to publish work on John Ely, so I uh, hope you will pursue some of those. I was also just thinking about um, the literary map of North Carolina at UNC Greensboro and wondering, um, to, I mean, I'm, I, I know they, they have Ely's work on there, but they're starting to do some walking tours as part of it. And so I would suggest you come up with that project and, and propose it to them. Um, uh, sounds like a, a great idea. Um, who else? Uh, who else would like to ask a question? I think Am I mute? had a question. Are you, I, I'm, Go ahead, Richard. Richard, okay, I can talk. Okay, I, I just wasn't yeah. sure. Um, I, I'm an outlander. I'm in Maryland, uh, but I fell in love with John Ely's books about five or six years ago. Um, started reading Landbreakers and just thought, wow, he's, I mean, and I read just through them. I run a book club now, um, and I've been trying to get some of the books <laughs> for my book club to read. Uh, they, they, we, we read the Landbreakers. I love it. But what I think I love the most about John Ely um, is his ability to put together what is wondrous, almost miraculous, and what is so ordinary. And he does it in his own, <laughs> he just has a touch about that and how he does that, um, that makes, um, that I have always, uh, and, and, and it kind of expands him. He is a, a person of real vision. Um, he doesn't get caught either in just, just the particulars. Um, there, is, there is always some sort of hope and almost transcendence going on. Um, and uh, I have always just admired how well, as well as just the wonderful writing, just I could read and any of what you, you read was just wonderful. And so I just uh, wanted, you know, to uh, just, just to say that, to add that bit uh, about him uh, that I was, I've been very taken with him. There's the only other writer I've ever seen come close is the, is a Kentucky guy named Wendell Berry, um, who I like a lot. Not as much as John Ely though. I like John Ely. I think he's just sort of the top of the, the he, he's just is, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I'm so, so sorry that there isn't more, um, there, he is not that well known. Uh, my book club just adored Landbreakers, every one of them, and um, and so we've got a uh, so we're trying. I'm trying to find a way now to bring more. To, we're going to read more of uh, John Ely, um, but it's hard. Um, I have to talk to the owners, and we have to <laughs> negotiate. But anyways, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and um, I, I'm sure by now you you've uh, discovered that Press Fifty Three has. Um, reissued new editions of several of the novels in the in the history series. So and and some of the other books of, of Ely's as well. So that's um, that are available. I am curious if one of the Ely people knows, or um, or one of the App Appalachian Lit people in our audience know why the road has been. Um, uh, reprinted more often. There are other new editions of it than some than the other books. I, I'm I'm just curious why that particular one. I didn't know whether Sandy might know or Kevin. You picked it, you picked it too. It's one of your first ones. Yeah. Well, um, no, I haven't. We haven't reissued the road. Uh, the University oh, thought, of Tennessee Press has the road in print. They brought it back into print in I think it was the late 1990s when it was selected for the um, uh, the on the same page or the big community read program in western North Carolina, Asheville and surrounding counties. And it's still in print with them. So uh, they've got the rights to that. Uh, I have been tempted to write to them and say, if you ever place this out of print, please let me know because I'm going to bring it back. We've got right now all seven of the books are in print. Um, we've got uh, The Road at University of Tennessee Press and The Land Breakers was acquired in 2014 from Press 53 for the uh, New York Classics Editions, uh, New York Review of Books Classics, um, which John, I gotta say, was not happy about. 
I, I had to talk to him for about a month to convince him. I was convinced at the time that I thought that, that having that book there would introduce his writing to a, a worldwide audience more than what we could do as a small press in North Carolina. But John loved Press 53. And he was, I, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think he, um, I don't know the right word for it. Uh, he was a little bit put off with me after that, that I convinced him to do that. Um, maybe not. He always, he was always happy to see me and we always had great conversations and spent time together. And so he never let it show, but I could just, I felt in the background, there was a sense of guilt on my part that I convinced him because I think John was done with the, the big New York publishing houses. And he liked what we were doing at Press 53 and he was always very supportive of that. But the other five books, uh, Journey of August King, Time of Drums, uh, The Winter People, um, Lion on the Hearth and Last One Home are all back in print with Press 53 and, and you'll find them on the website there as well. And Press 53 also has Move Over Mountain and The Free Men um, as well. So um, you can uh, find lots and lots of, of Ely. And, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that just reflects to me something I have loved since moving here um, like 25 years ago. And that is the community uh, and the generosity among writers and publishers and editors and all. I mean, it's such a strong community that you put John Ely before your own press to make to try to 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 get his work out there and and um and as I said you know I, I was when I first read him um, like Savannah like many of you I was so knocked over I thought why don't I know about this guy I just finished my PhD program why why wasn't any he included so um anyway I don't want to hog it who else who else would like to speak or has a question a or a comment go ahead. Um, so I am here to support Savannah. Um, so I only really know about Ely's work tangentially through what you've done. Um, I'm wondering if you could recommend sort of one piece to start and why that would be. Is that a hard question? No, it's a fun question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like many folks here tonight have mentioned, I mean, for me, you because there are similarities like um, we've mentioned tonight in the characters and some of the families and I, you got to start with the land breakers. I mean, you've got to, um, if you know, those of us in the, in the room, the virtual room tonight who have read that, you know what I mean with that rattlesnake story and the sheep story. And I mean, my mind is just aflame with all these scenes that are so, dramatic but not overdone in, in the slightest you know they just stick in your imagination they, you feel something when you read that you know um the land breakers is a great starting place for so many reasons with that um yeah it's it's wonderful <laughs> thank you i would have said the same thing um start at the beginning because then you're going to want to just keep going and might as well read them in order who else the only thing I want to say, uh, it's Richard again, is that Ely, as much as it's been hard to bring him to the public attention with even running a book club because the books are harder to get. For example, at my little bookstore that uh, the owners, they have one distributor and he doesn't always carry the books. Uh, he can't get them. Um, and the one we, we used, unfortunately, was the New York Times Review Book Edition because they could get that. Um, so I, I want to assuage Kevin's guilt a little bit. Um, you no, know, I think you did us all a service, you know. Um, anyway. May I share something briefly? Please do. Hi there. Um, I highly recommend using your local public library, especially if you're in North Carolina and have access to Libby, because a lot of the books are in Buncombe County and in Forsyth County, or you can also do interlibrary loan for people who don't want to uh, purchase the books quite yet or something. But what I really want to say is um, 
I feel strongly that the widow's trial is underappreciated and a very, very important book. And I really wish someday it would be made into a movie if it were the right people and the right director and producer. Thank you. Yeah, let me touch on The Widow's Trial, if I might. Um, that book is often mistaken as one of the mountain books. Um, and I once asked John, uh, because you know, when you read The Widow's Trial, it takes place in the 1970s, I believe, around there, in the same part of North Carolina. And uh, the heroine in that story is a plover girl. So the plovers are... They're throughout all John's novels, um, and, I, and I'm intrigued with the plovers. They're wonderful. But I asked John one time that, um, that a lot of people mistake The Widow's Trial as one of the mountain books. Um, so I asked him, why is it not one of the mountain books, since it takes place in the same part of the country? And he said, well, in the mountain books, the people rose to the new occasion, and in the widow's trial, they didn't. And I thought that was just genius, mm -hmm. brilliant. So, but I do have a lot of copies of the widow's trial. If anybody's interested in obtaining a copy of that, I've got a bunch of like three or four boxes of hardcovers of that. So much, this is how much John loved his books. When a book went out of print, rather than having the books destroyed, he would buy them from the publisher and put them in his attic, and he would give them out to friends when they came to visit. He would hand them out. You know, so he just loved his books. It was always about the book. I love that book, too, and, and he doesn't have to include it. I, I always think of it as an eighth book in the, um, in the series, so um, same family, but great. Who else? As far as getting the books for your book club, I would suggest, um, you know, y'all pooling and ordering from Press 53 um, the, the copies uh, directly instead of going through the bookstore, maybe, um, too, the owner, I, I, all the library copies as well. The, owner, the owners want, want to make a little money on their book club. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, oh, I'd be glad, oh, just, yeah. I would be glad to work with the bookstore on that. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk oh, later. Yeah. Great. Just, yeah. Great. Well, I'm glad you could join us tonight, Richard. Well, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> it was uncanny that just before I went on, I checked my email at about 630. And there's an email from Richard, who I've never met in my life. And he's talking about John Ely and how he'd read the Land Breakers. And he's trying to get more copies of the books. And I said, well, hey, we're having this thing tonight. <laughs> to honor John, you need to stop by. So... Thank you for coming, Richard. We'll talk sure. for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we still have a little more time if anybody wants to jump in with a question, but I want to make sure I get that thank you in there, um, helping us celebrate Savannah. I have a question for Savannah. Um, Thanks, Jack. First, congratulations, Savannah. This is so amazing. Um, so I just wanted to ask a question about the future, which is difficult, admittedly. Um, but I felt like before the pandemic, in terms of environmental writing and environmental activism, we were in a really good place. We had a lot of momentum. There are lots of jobs coming online for uh, eco-criticism and environmental humanities. Um, and also just nationally and globally, there are all these movements that were really exciting. Greta Thunberg getting so much attention, um, Extinction Rebellion getting so much attention um, across the pond here, the Standing Rock um, activist situation, um, more locally Appalachians against pipelines and all of Emily Satterwhite's amazing work. Um, so both for academics and for activists, I felt like the environmental movement was really taking off and perhaps was as exciting as it was in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, and then the pandemic brings everything to this grinding halt <laughs> and there are no more jobs 
And a lot of these activist endeavors have sort of slowed down or disappeared because we can't gather, we can't protest, we can't have marches. Um, so I guess my question is, what do you think happens next for environmental humanities folks like you, um, as well as for activist endeavors that were, um, you know, really seeing a lot of excitement before the pandemic? What, what do you think happens hopefully after the pandemic, you know, dies down. What, what, what's next, I guess is my question. That's a great question. And I've had similar, you know, worries, concerns, and thoughts, but I actually, well, and I, I love that I get to answer this question because I'm, I get to teach a, a special topics in rhetoric course for the fall here at Appalachian State, and that's going to be focused on environmental rhetoric. So I'm also kind of deep in that of, of thinking, how do, how do I teach about this too? You know, how do I, um, how do I make suggestions about what we read and selections of things like that? Um, I actually do think there's a lot of hope still um, with the environmental movement. I think if anything, you know, recent social protests surrounding Black Lives Matter have highlighted inequities within environmentalism that I think have been really deep seated and need to change. Um, so, for example, in a, you know, Southern Appalachia context, I'm excited about the group Black Folks Camp too, you know, and this sort of like, so, you know, digital sort of um, campaign that they're on to, you know, diversify outdoor representation. And I think um, there are many examples, you know, small scale activists and, and some academics kind of understanding that um, for environmentalism to, you know, improve everyone's life, it cannot be a, a white movement or upper middle class or privileged uh, movement in those sort of ways. The other thing that I will say that I'm thinking about, even in terms of my own course, is I think if anything, the pandemic could give us a hopeful encouragement to focus on the local. And I think that for me, with Everyday Nature, that's what John Ely's work does for me, too. It was this deep rootedness in where I'm from, you know, the region of the world in which I live. Um, so I think being able to keep encouraging activists, academics to um, partner with local groups. Um, for example, I'm hoping to take uh, graduate students in environment, by, environmental rhetoric course to meet folks who helped organize Elk Knob State Park. And I've been talking to, you know, Pat Beaver and some other kind of legends locally here in the, in the Boone area that helped us do that. As far as jobs, that is, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> who knows? But I do think that for those of us who are committed to things like environmental humanities, like John Ely, you know, it's like, this is the highlight of my week. So regardless if that's connected to a job, this is what we like. And I think good things happen when you follow that direction of your curiosity. So that's, I, I'm feeling hopeful about it. And I also have my first vaccine. So maybe that's why I'm so hopeful. <laughs> so I want to grab a piece of that good question, Zach. I want to note with Savannah's permission, because she mentioned Wilma Dykeman earlier, that John Ely and Wilma Dykeman are of a generation, and they were both racial justice activists, and Wilma in particular was an environmental activist, and their fiction, as well as their nonfiction, and for both of them, their nonfiction is really important, and I noticed earlier that Ann Stokely was on, she's uh, Wilma's daughter-in-law, um, I assume it's Ann, not Jim, or anyway, but so this, the, the, Wilma's in the house, so to speak, and what I want to bring to the fore is that I think one of the dangers in looking to the future is we sometimes forget the past. We forget that there were these brilliant um, activist writers and social justice um, gadflies who sometimes we get all caught up in the present moment and in contemporary Appalachian lit and in contemporary life. And we've got these um, real um, ancestors almost in, in all of these causes. And that's what I love about Savannah's essay, but I, but I wanted to connect some things there in response to your question, Zach. I think we've been worrying about this and working on this for a long time you know, and, and so I don't think it's going to go away. I, I really don't, so. I'm glad y'all brought up Wilma Dykeman. She is another writer who would, um, uh, you know, 
be a good subject for for uh, more work too because i agree with terry i think it's very important that we um keep these uh, previous generations of writers uh it, you know continue to teach them share them with our students and um uh, not let their works get dusty in the libraries uh, and again i thank kevin so much for introducing ely's work to me and uh to bringing it back in print so that other people can re continue to read it um uh, and and so much uh, thanks for all of you for coming um I know we're getting right up at eight o'clock. Uh, do we have a last question or comment or anything before we? I want to thank one, Savannah so much. One, one last comment. I'm a Connecticut okay. Yankee, by the way. I was Connecticut, but I have always admired the culture of language that is in the South and only the South in the United States of America. There are places, the English have this sense of their own language and but like it is in, it is the Southern writers that preserve this wonderful love of language, of poetry in a way that um, there are other sectional writers, but in some of them do, some of them don't. But I, I value that so much um, uh, in, 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 in the Southern writers and Ely is just a shining example of it. Just uh, anyways. Thank you. Well, I don't think you're going to get any argument from anybody in this audience on that. That's for sure. One of the pluses of the pandemic, one of the very, very few, has been being able to do this kind of activity and bring people from Connecticut to North Carolina for a Wednesday evening reading and, and panel discussion. Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you and, and, and with lots of thanks as always. You're muted. Okay. There we go. There you go. <sighs> okay. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I just want to add too that that there was a time when John Ely and Wilma Dyckwin were both very well known in their day in the '60s and '70s. Uh, John even into the '80s. Uh, but unfortunately, our culture is we have very short attention spans, you know, that, that people are forgotten so easily. And there are so many great, great pieces of literature out there that are just disappearing, which is why John inspired me when we reissued the Land Breakers at Press 53. And we were just a young press. We hadn't even been open six months when he gave us the rights to, to reissue that book. I think he was I think the reason he did that was it was like that man coming over the mountain in, in the land breakers with his wife in the wagon. She said, why are we settling here and not in Morgantown? And he said, because everything's settled in Morgantown. <laughs> yeah. He was looking for another adventure. And I think John saw that, uh, the Press 53 is that. And, but I fell in love with his books uh, and, and him. So we started the Carolina Classics Editions where we, we seek out these books that are put out of, placed out of print and are easily forgotten. They're just nobody, and there's no expiration date on good writing. It's, uh, you know, to this day, I, I don't understand how someone like John Ely could be overlooked. You know, when I talk to professors who teach Appalachian studies, some of them don't even know how to pronounce his name. I don't, I just, it befuddles me. I, I, and this, that needs to be fixed. You know, we need to, so uh, I want to keep the torch lit. You know, Terry's doing a great job with that as well. Um, we've got another project coming up in a few months that we can tell you about. I don't know if I should mention it tonight or not, Terry, should I? Yeah, well, okay, we'll just drop it on you guys because we're all a little family here. Um, about a year or so before John passed, he handed me a, a big manuscript uh, titled Four Sons and Four Brothers that he had written in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, and it's another Civil War novel. Um, and he just couldn't get it placed anywhere. And so he gave it to me and he gave it to Terry and we both read it 
and um, loved it. I thought it was just brilliant. And it's another one of those books where it's it takes place in the mountains in, uh, and also in Virginia and Pennsylvania and all this. But um, uh, I asked John, is this one of your, could this be part of your mountain book series? And he goes, oh, no, no. So it's not about that. <laughs> you know, so it was very interesting. So uh, four sons and four brothers. Um, and after John passed, I went on a hunt to find signed copies of his books because I never asked John to sign a book for me because I didn't want to, you know, uh, impose on our friendship that way. So, but I did find a copy of Time of Drums uh, in Asheville and it was signed and inscribed. And in it, it said, uh, in essence, I did, I just learned that four of my family were in the Civil War. My great grandfather and his three brothers all perished. And so there are four brothers right there. So four sons, four brothers. I think that might have been the inspiration for him writing this book. So um, we've edited the manuscript. We've um, we found earlier copies of it because there are four pages missing and Rosemary helped us find the missing pages and we piece this together and we're planning on uh, publishing this uh, on John's birthday this year on December 13. So visit Press 53, sign up for our emails and we'll, we'll keep you posted on, on things like this that are happening. But we're excited about this and um, we're uh, we know John would approve of it because he really wanted to see this book in print. And so I'm glad to do it for him. And with Terry's help and Marshall De Bruyne, who was one of John's editors, he helped out as well. And Rosemary Harris Ely, who has just been wonderful. Um, she's even read it and, and made notes on it. So um, it's wonderful. Anyway, just wanted to share that with everyone. Wow. So, so exciting. Yeah, to do the Terry. That is exciting. Uh, Kevin let me read it last year. Loved it. Oh, that's right. I did send you a copy, didn't I, Margaret? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Wow. I keep thinking it keeps coming back to my mind. And, you know, every now and then I'll read something. I'll think, oh, yeah, I wonder if that book's going to come out because something will trigger it. And uh, so. Yeah. Well, we had planned to um, we had planned to publish it earlier, but then when COVID hit, it was like we need to do this where we can really have a, a celebration and where everybody can get together and meet. And we have a feeling that by December we should be in that position to do that. And doing it on John's birthday just makes sense because John never wanted anybody to mention his birthday ever. <laughs> he didn't like that, so I thought, well. We're going to do it anyway on his birthday and celebrate him. <laughs> maybe, maybe he'll show up and tell us to stop it. So that would be nice. So anyway, I miss John every day. I'm, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Margaret, thank you again for uh, the, the idea of the John Ely Prize. And Terry, everything that you've done. Savannah, thank you for choosing the road this and, and finding that little nugget that most people miss it's just it means the world to me so mm -hmm. um with that uh i'll let margaret say good night to everybody again yes I, I repeat all those thanks thanks for sharing your essay with nclr thank you to zach for introducing savannah to me some years back um and um getting uh, us acquainted so that she knew about nclr to submit this essay to it we're one big family and i hope you will all join that family subscribe read her essay in the um in, in the it comes out in the summer and in the meantime you can pick up the 2010 and the 2012 to read more about john neely so Fantastic. thank you all very much excellent issues you got to have them in your library Thank you all so yeah. much. Thank oh. you. Thanks, hey, thanks so much. Thanks, Margaret. Well, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks for spending your evening with us. <laughs>